All right, so Alex, whenever you are ready, you can go <clears throat> ahead. Let's talk about total laboratory automation in clinical microbiology. Highly automated systems are fairly common in the clinical chemistry and hematology labs, and they're increasingly common in clinical microbiology. Here are some of the questions we'll answer today. What does total laboratory automation look like in the clinical microbiology lab? Are there still manual steps required? In other words, how total is total? What are the benefits of total laboratory automation? Is it good for the lab staff, the caregivers, or best of all, the patients? And finally, what's it like to convert your lab to total laboratory automation? What kind of time and resources are needed? Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your host, JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I'm joined by two ex expert guests today. Dr. Carrie Ann Burnham is the Medical Director of Microbiology at Barnes Jewish Hospital and a Professor of Pathology and Immunology, Molecular Microbiology, Pediatrics, and Medicine at University of Washington School of Medicine. She's the Vice Chair of Faculty Mentoring and Advancement at WashU. Dr. Burnham is also an editor of JCM. Welcome, Carrie Ann, and thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, and I just wanted to clarify, I'm at Washington University. What did I say? University of Washington? You did, which is a terrific institution. It just doesn't happen to be where I am. Thanks for catching that. I appreciate it. We're also joined by Dr. Aaron McElvania, who's the Director of Clinical Microbiology at North Shore University Health System and a Clinical Assistant Professor at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Dr. McElvania is also an editor of JCM. Welcome, Aaron, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Carrie Ann, let's start with you, please. I'd like to start by asking how you would define total laboratory automation or TLA. Well, that is a great question and uh, one that if you wind me up, I could talk about for a while. Um, but in the context of today's discussion, I'm going to define total laboratory automation as a system that automates culture-based testing in the clinical micro laboratory. So that is really the process of taking a specimen, applying it to culture medium that's labeled with a barcode, streaking out the plates, and then moving those plates to incubators using a track system and automating the incubation process for those culture plates. So in general, automation systems are most efficient when they're handling liquid specimens, such as urine specimens, but they do have ways to accommodate specimens that are not liquid, such as tissue or liquids that are available in a very small or limited quantity. It has been demonstrated that in the clinical lab, we actually spend a large part of our day inoculating broth, um, broth and plates. And so this is really a task where instrumentation can help because we can automate processes that are easily automatable, automatable and free up our laboratory staff to work on other duties that require their specific expertise. As I mentioned, a component of the TLA is the incubation system, which is attached to a high resolution camera system. The laboratory then determines at what intervals the culture plates are photographed. The plates are viewed by medical technologists to determine what additional workup or interaction is needed with the plates, such as microorganism identification or antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So although culture-based automation systems uh, like to come with the moniker TLA, there are aspects that make the T and TLA seem like a little bit of a reach um, for example, plates that require incubation in anaerobic conditions cannot be incubated on the system at this time. Um, but even with those limitations, the LA and TLA represent some major advancements for the clinical microbiology laboratory. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Erin, what would you say are the main benefits of TLA? Who, who benefits from TLA? Um, I mean, I think everyone can benefit from TLA, but I'm a very biased um, population here. I think the main um, things that it gains is really quality, I would say, is the number one thing that I am impressed with with TLA. Things such as specimen labeling, making sure the right specimen goes onto the right plate, um, those kind of quality assurances that, although they don't happen often in microbiology, we're moving around millions of plates a year, and so they happen from time to time. So I think it cuts down on errors. Um, the other quality metric I would say is that spreading the uh, specimen across the plate is done in a very uniform manner, and I know everyone who has 
uh, you know, witnessed their technologists streaking plates or done it themselves or just been on microbiology rounds, sees that there is a lot of variation in streaking patterns between different technologists. Um, and I think the total laboratory automation process just makes it uniform between specimens. And so that when you're looking at the plates, um, you know, you just have a better sense of, you know, the quantity that is there. Um, I would say the third thing is efficiency. I mean, since we've gotten total lab automation at North Shore, I came after it was implemented, um, which I always joke is the best way to acquire total laboratory automation. Um, but even in the time that I've been here, I've seen if gains in efficiency. Um, just the number of cultures that technologists can go through in a day is just phenomenal when they're not moving plates around, when they're um, you know, not not plating the specimens themselves. It's it's just mind boggling. And then the third efficiency that I feel like people don't really, or the third thing that people don't really talk about that much is teaching. I really think that since we have um, a med tech school and we have residents and they're sitting on the bench going through the cultures and such, I really see a benefit for teaching. Um, you have all your plates available. You're looking at them all at once. Uh, if you want to know on day three what it looked like initially on day one, you can go back and look. And I just feel like this accelerates the teaching program. Thank you, Erin. I just wanted to agree that I think that's a really great point. I'm sorry, Carrie. This the point about teaching specifically? Yes, yes, the yeah. point about teaching and, and having the plates there as a resource. Okay. It also helps when you're troubleshooting different cultures. I know we meet weekly uh, with our staff to go over just, you know, laboratory issues. And when we have problems with people overworking cultures or, um, you know, just different, um, I think we had one recently when people instead of picking colonies were kind of uh, doing a little bit more of a sweep. We have all of the images available and we can go back and show how, yeah, it looked pure on day one when you did your sweep, but it wasn't. And that's why our susceptibility is mixed. And it just like really has these visual, allows for visual, um, you know, pictures. So technologists, I mean, sure, you can tell them and that's fine, but I feel like it makes a bigger impact when you can show them problems rather than just talk about them. So it sounds like the, the overall improvements are quality and consistency across the board and then efficiency as well, mm -hmm. um, yes. as well as the educational benefits you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Ann, an additional benefit is around the recovery of fastidious organisms using TLA, and you had a nice letter in JCM about that. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked. Um, that was a really fun and somewhat surprising investigation that I worked on with one of our former microbiology fellows, Dr. Bill Lanehart. And so the history on this is that the first specimen that we put onto our TLA was urine. And this was for a variety of reasons. We don't routinely perform gram stain on urine, so it didn't have that complexity. There's no anaerobic plates and it's a high volume specimen. And I mean, high volume in multiple senses of the word. So it's a very frequent specimen coming into our laboratory, but it's also a specimen that usually comes with lots of volume. So low risk in terms of adopting a new process and really has great potential to improve efficiency and standardization. And so once we had started on our journey and we had implemented TLA in our laboratory for urine cultures, we started to notice that we were recovering Neisseria gonorrhea with some regularity from our urine specimens and on the blood plate, um, which is sort of interesting because in general, textbooks tell us that Neisseria gonorrhea shouldn't grow all that well on blood auger. So based on this initial observation, we were curious if the recovery of other microorganisms from urine cultures was also affected. And in looking this in a little bit more detail, we found that prior to implementing the TLA system, we recovered 199 organisms per 1,000 urine cultures. And after implementation, this increased to 224 organisms per 1,000 urine cultures. There was a modest increase in the recovery of some common neuropathogens, such as E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae, but there was a dramatic increase in the recovery of some of the more fastidious microbes, such as Actinotignum, Alloscardovia, Staphylococcus saprophyticus, Aerococcus urinae, and then importantly, the Neisseria gonorrhea that led us to look at this in more detail. In fact, we observed more than a 100% increase in the recovery of Staph saprophyticus and Aerococcus, 
And if you can believe it, more than a 300% increase in the recovery of Neisseria gonorrhea. Of course, for that last one, user experience may vary. We do happen to live in a, a region of the country that has a very high incidence of Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, but since we've reported this finding, similar findings have also been reported by other investigators who use TLA, such as Stefan Zimmerman and Irene Burkhardt at Heidelberg. Um, and I, I think there are many reasons that contribute to the observation that we had in this study. I think one of the most important contributions is the fact that plates are incubated without interruption in an optimal atmosphere and at an optimal temperature through their duration of their journey. And the fact that plates are viewed on en as enlarged images on high resolution monitors using multiple different lighting conditions. So this really helps to see different types of colonies, including small colonies that might be on the plate. The consistency in incubation, I think, is really one of the big changes from the traditional microbiology workflow. I'm a little embarrassed, but I'll share the embarrassing data that we did observational studies in our laboratory. And then we found that prior to the use of TLA, plates were left outside the incubator for about half an hour on the first day when they were initially inoculated. And then from two to seven hours on the next day with an average of three, depending on where exactly those plates went on their journey in the lab. And so these conditions have a big impact on the growth and recovery, especially of more fastidious microbes. And then perhaps a little bit less interesting finding um, from our study, but one that can definitely impact lab workflow, is we saw a lower number of urines that had no growth and a higher number that had clinically insignificant growth. So while it didn't change their clinical interpretation, it did change the way that the lab staff had to interact with a certain proportion of the urines. Um, in addition to enhanced recovery of fastidious microbes, we found that even those hardy microbes can grow more quickly in optimal incubation conditions. So we've made some adjustments along the way to get to the Goldilocks principle of just right in terms of when we start the workup. Um, so for example, when we started our journey with urine on TLA, we imaged the plates at 18 hours and 24 hours, and meaning that 18 hours was the earliest where we might start our workup. Um, but we saw the colonies were very large at 18 hours, and so we adjusted it so that the first picture was taken at 16 hours. And so you would think, okay, you're changing it by two hours, so the turnaround time should be two hours difference, right? Well, this really had an outsized impact on the overall turnaround time just because of the way the plates became available for reading in terms of our shifts and our overall lab workflow. So just to give you an example, we observed a median reduction in time to final result for cultures with E. coli, which makes up more than half of our urine cultures, of 14.2 hours. So this was a, a change in median time to final results from 77 hours to 63 hours. Um, so there were a lot of small things about the process along the way I had not anticipated, including all of that gonorrhea and the need to make subtle changes to really optimize the turnaround time and laboratory workflow. Thank you, Karian. Um, I think people may not appreciate how much time plates spend out of the incubator in the clinical microbiology laboratory. Once they're out, they may be out for a long time while the queue is being worked. And then people may not appreciate how often the door is opened to the incubator with, you know, maybe four or five different benches working and four or five different technologists going in and out of the incubator. So you're saying it's not just my embarrassing finding that plate spent a lot of time outside the incubator. <laughs> no, I think it's familiar to all of us. Yes, um, and I would say that we had the same experience where we're getting more fastidious organisms, we're getting more insignificant, low growth instead of negative cultures. And we actually, because of some of these, we had to kind of hone our procedures a little bit more to um, not be reporting these things we never saw before and really, um, you know, I guess, address the significance or non-significance of, of some of these organisms we're routinely now identifying. It comes back to something you mentioned earlier, the the uh, tendency to overwork cultures um, yes. and the need to keep after that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Ann, uh, unlike Aaron, you went through a long process to set up TLA in the laboratory. Aaron mentioned that the best way to have TLA was to come into the lab after someone else had set it up. Um, but you went through that process at Barnes Jewish Hospital, and we talked quite a bit while you were doing it. Can you tell us w what went into that? Um, what was needed for the physical changes to the laboratory? How did you have to redesign, and how did it affect just beginning with that physical part and, and the other pieces needed for that uh, setup? 
That's a great question, and I just have to agree that Erin has it right. If you can walk in while it's uh, already underway, that does save a lot of heartache. Um, well, I was going to say, my second part to that is you can come to a lab that has TLA, but not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not giving away my job. <laughs> All right, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> uh, uh, moving on, I start by saying um, that we were really in a lucky position, um, made it a lot easier than it could have been because we were moving into a brand new constructed laboratory space. So this meant we had the benefit of designing the space from the get-go to accommodate the automation. And there were some things that I had not anticipated, such as the need to reinforce the floor from the get-go just to accommodate the weight of the instrument. And then also we were lucky because this new building had a very large freight elevator to move the equipment into our lab. Um, colleagues have shared with me that are not moving into new buildings that sometimes a window has to be moved out of the lab so that they can crane the equipment into the lab. So, you know, we didn't have any of that headache. That was great. Um, we also had the luxury of having the install take place in the new lab while we were still working in the old lab, so we didn't have to sort of fight through that process simultaneously. Um, so despite my whining earlier, I do realize how spoiled we were. Um, in addition to the physical space and hardware, there were a lot of other things to prepare for. For example, we needed to expand our server capabilities, um, and there were a lot of surprises along the way there also. Um, when we started, we were having all these connectivity issues that were really frustrating, and they happened more on the day than on other shifts. And after a lot of troubleshooting, it turned out that the voice over IP lines that were um, using the same network as the keystroke was just too much data, and it couldn't accommodate it all. So I learned the word voice over IP during that process, <laughs> a lot more about servers than I had <laughs> ever anticipated. Um, so another task that had to be done well in advance was transitioning the institution specimen collection systems to containers that are best suited for TLA. Fortunately, we were already on the e-swab system, so we had the liquid swab handling that's needed, but we had to go through a transition for urines to have no more cups for culture, but rather having the specimens sent to us in boric acid vacutainer tubes so they were automation ready. And this was a good change for many reasons, but it was a big lift across a hospital system and uh, our clinic system. And so I would encourage labs who are thinking of switching to automation to do this well in advance if it's not already in place, because it's just one more thing that's hard to manage simultaneously while you're bringing up the automation. And then the other big change was laboratory consolidation. So the microbiology testing from several other hospitals in our healthcare system was being relocated to our center. And that was part of the business case to support the cost of automation. So the, the change management with all of those other hospitals was a component as well. So while automation was the driving force, there was a lot of pieces that fed into it. When you when you brought in those additional laboratories, did you have to increase the number of technologists as well, or did the did the TLA offset that? That that's a great question. So we did have a modest increase in technologists, definitely not one proportionate to the amount of workflow that was relocated. And of course, that's not all due to TLA. There are some efficiencies of scale, like you know you only need one blood culture procedure, not five that were in the five labs before, and some streamlined QC. Um, but when I think about, for example, the number of urines we handle each day now with consolidation, I just can't imagine if someone had to physically organize, sort, and move all of those plates around the laboratory. Got it. And, and when you were bringing in TLA and uh, when you were setting it up and so on, how did it affect the technologists in the laboratory? Did it create new opportunities for them? Was the training difficult? What, what went on with them? Yeah, that is a great question. And the, the answer is somewhat bimodal. So this transition brought on a lot of change in our laboratory. And some people actually decided this just wasn't a change that they felt like being part of. Um, this was more people who were in the advanced stages of their career. And they used this change as uh, sort of a deciding factor when choosing their retirement date. On the other hand, there were many people who loved it and used it as a chance to learn and grow. And there were people with leadership abilities under the surface that emerged. Um, and we had many people who demonstrated great creativity and problem solving and, and came up with really wonderful processes. 
Um, so the, the training overall was a big part of the lift, and there was some training that was done prior to implementation that was classroom style, such as teaching people some of the basics of the software. Uh, the automation system has software similar to learning a whole other LIS, um, so there can be a big learning curve there. And then specialists from the company came and we had designated laboratory super users who then trained their colleagues. And selecting those super users carefully is essential because you need people who have a positive attitude and will really take to the change quickly so that they can bring their other colleagues along. Um, and honestly, it's a continuous process of learning. We're, we're always learning and refining. Um, so I, I would say some of the major takeaways is it, it revealed that some people just don't feel comfortable with that amount of change, but other people really rose to the challenge and the creativity that came out was better than I ever could have anticipated in advance. So this is a sort of a, uh, a grim question, but one that I think people wonder about quite a bit in terms of TLA. What happens if the TLA system breaks down? If one of my incubators breaks down, I just move everything into the other incubator similar with the blood culture machines, similar with the microscopes, you just shift from one to the other. But you, it's hard to imagine having redundancy with TLA. So what do you do if it, if it breaks down? Uh, you cry and run out of the lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's step one for sure. No, I, I spent like, you know, the first two years of my job here just thinking, um, I hope this never happens, or just being so scared of what would happen if the whole TLA went down. And I'll, I must say that most of the time it's scheduled downtime. So they're gonna do software upgrade, things like that. They, they work with us to schedule it during our least busy time. You're down for two hours, four hours, and we just put everything on hold and wait for everything to come back online. And the efficiency of the TLA is so great that it doesn't make sense to start manually streaking plates at that point. Um, at least in our in our lab. Um, but we did have one downtime, unexpected, the whole system down, plates trapped in incubators. Um, and you know, it was not fun and we survived. So I will say what happens is your technologist use their excellent skills that they acquired to troubleshoot and people started streaking plates um, and putting away just like we did before TLA. Um, we pulled plates out of the incubator and started sorting them and we came up with processes of sorting them so we could find them. And uh, I think we were down for several days unexpectedly, but um, you know, we did the best we could, we made it through, we survived. Um, I think the transition between things in the incubator uh, in the in the um, TLA incubators to the things that you would set up manually and they're you know all your plates are together. Um, once you you bridge that, you're you're pretty much home free and um, a lot of overtime. It sounds pretty trying. I, have you faced the same challenge, Carrie Ann? We we have, although um, similar to Aaron's experience, it's very rare that the system is completely down. And even if one component is down, it's almost always possible to work with the other parts of the system. So for example, if the pipetting unit is down, the barcoder usually still works. So you can plate the you can streak out the plates manually, but then put them on the track for incubation so everything else follows the same process. Um, and our system has six incubators, um, three air and three CO2. And so sort of similar to your prior example, Alex, usually they're not all full. And so you can move them into other incubators that are working. Um, but uh, not to be negative, but I also want us to remember it's not only a TLA down that you need to worry about, but an LIS down has an impact on you much more than it does in a manual microbiology. So in manual micro, there's no doubt it affects it. But if the instrument can't read the barcode to know the specimen type and what to do, that, that can be quite challenging as well. So really a good service contract is essential and you need to understand the terms of your contract and the pathway to escalate if something catastrophic occurs outside of your usual service window. You know, just waiting till Monday is not an adequate answer. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, much like the microbes, I'm a rather fastidious person. And so our TLA downtime manual is a little bit of a mini novel. I meant to check the number of pages before this call and I forgot. Um, but it has instructions for the various scenarios 
scenarios that can occur, such as if you're not able to pipette or if the inoculation unit's completely down, if the incubators are down, if the track is down, and then uh, really an SOP to follow if we have planned LIS downtime or unplanned LIS downtime. Um, because those moments are so stressful, we found that having the how-to book and just following that is much easier than reinventing the wheel. And the reason this procedure is so robust is because we've had every one of those situations and we debrief and then have the procedure moving forward. Um, we also keep an error log, which errors in general are not so drastic as downtime, but it can allow us to look for patterns because when you have people working across all shifts, if you don't document it that way, you might miss it. So we can make adjustments before we do have um, something really catastrophic. Um, and then a whole new kind of down came with COVID, which I thought we could escape this call without talking about it, um, <laughs> but with all the media shortages. If we didn't have the specific media that was compatible with our system, we were doing a lot of validations and adjustments there to keep using, to keep the system going with the media that was available to us. So, I mean, the major lessons are to be flexible and patient and you grow more resilient over time as you become accustomed to the more common um, disruptions and how to solve them. Yeah, I, compl I completely agree that most times it's just a small component down as like, you know, like uh, Dr. Carrie Ann mentioned, your pipe header, and then you you have ways to work around that. Um, I would just say another thing is we work really closely with our BD engineers to, like you said, the error log, identify problems that keep happening so maintenance can be done before it becomes a serious issue. Um, and we do a lot of preventative maintenance, both uh, a little bit by our lab staff, but mostly by our uh, engineers who, who are we have a hefty service contract and they're around a lot and always changing belts and motors and such to, to prevent disaster. Thank you both. Aaron, this is something that we touched on a little bit earlier, but if uh, there's more information to fill this out, how, how has TLA affected the way that specimens are collected at North Shore? Um, I would just, um, you know, completely agree with Carrie Ann in that um, from what I hear when we started, we were not um, switched to e-swabs for wound cultures and that we made that change at the same time as going to changing to TLA. And um, uh, that is never recommended. You should definitely do that in advance if you think there's a, a a chance that you might be moving along that line. Plus, I think for quality reasons, it also makes a lot of sense. But just getting everything you can in a liquid form or something that can be handled by your TLA is really important. Um, I would say we did the same with the boric acid tubes for urine as well, um, getting all your urine out of sterile cups and, and into um, TLA compatible containers is great. I mean, there's some things that are never going to be compatible, such as surgical tissues, for example. Um, but luckily, we have procedures to um, handle those in semi-automated modes where you're getting most of the function out of your TLA by grinding the tissue yourself, and but the plates are being labeled, so you have that quality component. Um, you place your specimen on the plates, and then the instrument streaks it for you and puts them in the incubator, so you get almost the full I guess, automated process, um, even though you can't ever pipette a tissue per se. Got it. And Aaron, I think most of the listeners are probably pretty familiar with what goes on in clinical microbiology laboratory. Uh, the technologist might begin their day by pulling plates from the incubator, uh, taking those over to the bench, sitting down, going through the queue, looking at each plate and setting up whatever tests need to be done for that culture. Maybe moving some plates over to the area where susceptibility is done, or where Malditoff is done for identification and so on. How is the workflow different from the technologist's perspective? How do they spend their time uh, with TLA as opposed to without TLA? Yeah, the setup is very different, um, although I'm sure there are various ways different labs handle this. But so in our lab, we have um, all of our workups split into readers and workers. And there are two physically distant benches. Um, the, what the readers functions are, are looking at the monitor and going through the cultures that are ready to read, those that have been imaged after whatever time period we deemed, um, we, we set up in the computer to have them imaged and they go through and look at them and just um, mark in the LIS system, no growth, or if they have mixed flora, that kind of thing. Um, what's interesting about 
their reading process now is a they're doing it all on computers and they're looking at all the plates at once on the on the screen although they are able to click on the plates and make them bigger if they want a closer look but the other thing that they can do is at that point they will read the plates and then let's say you have a urine that has greater than 100,000 colonies of e coli presumptively you know um, you're going to go in uh, to the plate and circle one of the colonies and you say what you want done with it. Do you want uh, a catalase? Do you want a MALDI, this colony? Do you want susceptibility testing? You, you put the task on there. Um, then what happens is after uh, readers have read you know, many plates, um, there all these tasks go on a list for a, um, for the workers bench. So this is the other kind of area of the lab where technologists are attached, uh, sit at bench attached to our TLA. And so what happens is they will see on their task list like 10 urine moldies that need to be done. They will pull those plates out of the, they'll call those plates out of the incubators. So they come on the track to their workstation and then they will, have the physical plates to do whatever they need to do with it. And it doesn't call all the plates for a culture, only the ones you need. So um, you might only need a blood or a McConkie plate and you call that out. So it's kind of two different work, I would say workflows, the reader and the worker, but then they also work together. So if you are say the first person in the lab and you are assigned to be a worker for the day, but there's no work to be done because no one has been reading. Um, what you know, you don't just sit there at your computer and like surf Google. Well, you you might, but what you what you should be doing as soon as the second person shows up and realizes what you're doing, you move to the reader station and you read plates to make some work, and then you can move back over to the worker station. And by then, you know your colleagues have shown up and they're also reading, and so. Uh, and conversely, at the end of the day, the, the you know worker bench gets a little heavier because all the reading may have been completed. So the people who are reading don't just sit there; they go over and help the workers out, or maybe they um, do other tasks around the lab um, that need to be done throughout the course of the day. So um, it's split a lot different. It, the ownership is just different. It's like all the cultures are our cultures and our problem versus. I have this stack and these are so the stack. These are my plates. These are my cultures. I will do, I will work on them and I will own them. And when I'm done, I'm done. So um, it's just a more collegial collaborative way to, to move through the workflow. And I think that, um, you know, really, really um, adds to the efficiency of the process, but also just kind of changes the culture of the lab. Just that, all for one kind of attitude. At least uh, that's what I've seen. Oh. I'm sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Um, you can check that off on your bingo oh. card. Um, when you were describing that, you described a technologist who would be sitting and looking at a screen and then marking the colonies that needed additional mm -hmm. workup. Um, one kind of cool thing that is still I think developing, although it may be in use in some laboratories, is machine learning to analyze images of the culture plates um, for specific types of cultures. And you wrote a commentary, Erin, about this in JCM that was titled, Machine Learning Takes Laboratory Automation to the Next Level. Can you tell us how image analysis in TLA can change the work in the clinical micro lab? Yeah, I think this is another level of efficiency that can be applied onto your total lab automation as we make, um, as we look for ways to make these systems more and more efficient. Um, the idea is that why does someone need to sit there and look at a negative urine plate and say no growth and final it and send it to the trash when this is a process that could be automated by machine learning? Um, and I just think it's a, a wild. Uh, we get a lot of urines as well, although not I'm not sure as many as carry in, but we have a large outpatient service. And so I just imagine the day when um, we receive a boric acid tube into the lab, we log it in, we put it on Keystra, and if that is a no growth or negative urine, we never see it again. We never have any other interaction with it. It goes, it's plated, it goes, uh, the plates go in the incubator, they're imaged, uh, some kind of machine learning application identifies that nothing grew it updates the uh, LIS, and so that goes out to the physician. Then at the end of the incubation period, 
It does a final read. It says no growth. Um, updates, finals, the culture, and sends the plates to the garbage. So um, I think that's kind of the future of where things are going. Um, we don't currently have this in my laboratory yet. My system is not FDA approved, but it is uh, in the works. And um, another aspect of kind of the machine learning is can you sort, can you sort different plates in, in different ways that you would like? And I would say that this is a little beyond maybe what companies are looking at, but I can just imagine a day when I want to know everything. So if I look at my urines, I want to auto final all the no grows then I want to sort them. So when my technologists get in in the morning, they're reading all the ones that have greater than 100,000 pure growth of an organism. So they can start with the most high acuity plates, work through those, and then later on in the day, they get to like uh, 50, you know, 50,000 mix, kind of see if anything's interesting there, probably some fun Foley catheters, that kind of stuff, move it down the road. Um, whereas those first ones are already getting susceptibility testing and kind of, you know, moving through the system. So you could really use this holistically with all specimen types. I mean, there's nothing special about a urine no growth plate and like a wound no growth plate. I would think that we could train machines to read them both and then really utilize our technologists and prioritize the culture. So the most acute are being looked at first and then you can move down the line to those um, less, I would say like less interesting ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erin. <laughs> So tell me first, Carrie Ann, uh, if you go first, please, what, what was the greatest challenging uh, challenge in setting up or using TLA in the laboratory? What should people be on the lookout for? Yeah, that is a great question. I, I think the hardest part for us relates to something that Aaron really emphasized is the reimagining the workflow. This is not just my culture. I don't read the stack at my bench and when I'm done, I'm done. All the cultures become the lab's cultures. Um, so there's multiple touch points, making sure things don't fall through the cracks and changing the, the culture of the lab to that. Um, there, there are some other more minor things such as developing a QC and QA system, especially for early adopters. Those weren't really in place um, and they had to be sort of invented by the lab director and being prepared for downtime. Um, and then also adjusting companion workflows, such as training off shifts to do things that maybe they hadn't done before. Um, we've done some other things to adjust our workflows, like we've validated setting up susceptibility testing at eight hours. So for our blood cultures, we can start with that first read. Um, and then this, I guess, is not really a challenge, but something to watch out for is that through the transition, the lab director really needs to stay positive and be the cheerleader and help um, remind the laboratory staff why they're doing this, the benefits, and that uh, the pain will be worth it on the other end. Pain yeah. will be worth it. And hey, Aaron, I, what would you add to that? I'm sorry. Please. Go oh, ahead. I was going to say I had the the same thing. There's, I think I was not physically there, but I am very close to my technologist. Um, and their advice is that you don't go live during Christmas week, um, which our administration did not heed that, and uh, they still have PTSD. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I would say that the culture of change is probably the biggest thing that they talked about, just the, the transition from my bench um, and I'm done when I'm done and then I'm out of here versus everyone. But I feel like the collaboration has really um, affected our lab even beyond um, even beyond total laboratory automation. I feel like a lot of our success as we're dealing with COVID um, and all the changes that come to that, testing and, and our volumes and micro kind of yin yanging around and, and us helping out other areas of the, the lab. Um, a lot of that, um, was I would say that the culture was already there to have that feeling of we'll help out to do whatever is necessary whenever it's necessary and I I'm not sure without keys without uh, laboratory automation we would have kind of been as prepared for that I mean you can't you cannot really prepare but I think those um, those features of all for one have really done us well during COVID times when there have been so many changes and we're very flexible and we just kind of roll with it um, for sure. Thank you. Um, 
we have a little tradition on this podcast, at least on the JCM version of the podcast, and that is that we like to have a little game at the end of the podcast. Uh, you guys are going to work together, which is good because I know that you're both that you are close friends. Um, so this is a game in which you are going to try to determine which of these actinobacteria phages is fake. And I pulled this from a really fun website called phagesdb.org, um, which describe the description is an interactive site that collects and shares information related to the discovery, characterization, and genomics of phages that infect bacterial hosts within the phylum actinobacteria. And it looks to me, I don't quite know, but it looks to me as if uh, undergraduates can isolate phages, describe the phages, and then they get to name the phages. And some of the names are a lot of fun. So I've got three sets here. I will name three bacteriophages. Two of the names are real. One of the names is fake. And your job is to figure out which one is the fake. So and can I confirm these were named by high schoolers? High schoolers? For sure. Or, well, or high schooler is an option of people who do this. I have the impression that the people who named these were in their youth, and that, okay. will, become, that will become clear to you. <laughs> um, and they also get to put in a little, uh, they get to put in naming notes where they can describe why they, where they can say why they chose the name that they chose. So here are your first three choices. I'll read you the name and then the naming notes that the uh, people put in. First choice, some pig. Naming notes, a spider will save this phage from slaughter. Next choice, choice, Ichabod Crane, and here are the naming notes. Ichabod Crane is a Siphoviridae with a distinguishable long and flexible tail. Capturing intact phage for imaging was complicated because its lengthy tail and capsid were severed throughout the sample. The slaughtered scenes were rem reminiscent of the sleepy hollow tail of lanky and headless Ichabod Crane. The time and wooded location in which the phage was discovered also befitted the Halloween season. And then your third choice in this group is Dobby's sock and the naming notes this phage is a free elf. So you've got choices some pig, Ichabod crane, and Dobby's sock. Which of those do you think is fake and you can work together? Well this is a challenge. Usually in multiple choice they say the one that's disproportionately long is the distractor but what do you think Aaron? Um, I was thinking the Ichabod crane was a little too detailed but Maybe maybe I'm wrong. But although Alex is brilliant, I don't see him spending half a day coming up with that descriptor. Maybe he'll surprise me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I was leaning towards some pig um, because the people who, well, I don't know. Y you pick, Aaron. I'm too conflicted. Can't decide. I, um... Do you want to hear the choices again? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I, I don't think that was the problem. All right. Um, well, now, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Let's see. I wish I had my children here. <laughs> they could probably tell me. Um, but I want to think about Craig. Ichabod Craig. Okay. It was just like so long. Yeah. Ichabod Crane is real. Uh, yeah. That long scary. description is a real description. Um, some pig is the one that was made up. <laughs> you see, I um, obviously don't know many high schoolers. <laughs> Carrie Ann, were you going to say that some pig didn't seem like it was the right generation? Yeah, I was going yeah. to, and then I thought maybe that just made me an old lady, so I stopped. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go on to our next choices here. Uh, so our next, your next choices are, first, Frodo Swaggins. Naming notes, I was inspired by the Lord of the Rings. Next, Octavius Rex. Naming notes, I named my phage Octavius Rex because it's a character from SpongeBob and SpongeBob is funny. I can confirm that. I watched SpongeBob with our daughter. And then the last choice, the Shredder. Naming notes, named for head of the Foot Clan of evil ninjas in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So Frodo Swaggins, Octavius Rex, and the Shredder. Which one is fake? I'm leaning towards Frodo's wagon, Frodo's wagon, although by my last logic, Shredder would be the wrong generation. I had the same feeling, but I want you to pick this time because obviously Ichabod Crane was such a great choice. All right, I'll go with Frodo's wagon. 
you sure? It seemed like you had a pretty good way of analyzing this on the first one. You want to stick with Frodo Swaggins? Okay, then you're letting me Frodo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm off. misleading you. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles have come back, I think. Have they? They seem to go away and come back all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Final choice? Your choice. All right. We'll, we'll go with Shredder then. The Shredder is correct. That's the one I made up. Frodo Swaggins yeah. and Octavius Rex are both real. All right. Well, the we last set. Today. Oh, oh there you are. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. The first choice is Sloopy. And the naming notes are, are Sloopy Doopy, Sloopy, Sloop, Sloop. <laughs> Next choice is BG. Naming notes. It is named after the band with the popular song, quote, Staying Alive, which we listen to while working. Last choice, Rona. Naming notes. I have chosen the name Rona because the phage was found during the COVID-19 pandemic. What do you think? Well, I'm a big Bee Gees fan, so I'd like to believe that one's real. I agree, but I'm not sure if people are listening to the Bee Gees that much. But, I don't know, things, go, things are cyclical. Now everyone's big on Fleetwood Mac. Well, should we stick with the generational poll or any preference, Aaron? I, I'd go Bee Gees, although the Sloop one... If I was writing a distractor, but I really like had very little time, I think I would do the shlooby one. That's correct. That's exactly <laughs> what happened. <laughs> uh, as a question writer for many things, I was like, oh, out of town, out, out of yes. time. <laughs> I, I wrote Sloopy just before we started recording. So excellent job. <laughs> I'm, I'm impressed that they're listening to the Bee Gees though. That's, that's good to know. I thought that was nice too. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you both. Great job. I think that was two out of three. Uh, you have won the awesome bragging rights for the podcast. Um, let's see. We're going to put uh, links to several of the articles and the other material that we discussed on the webpage for the podcast. Uh, you can find the journal at Journal of Clinical Microbiology or jcm.asm.org. Carrie Ann and Aaron, thank you both very much. This has been a lot of fun, and I think it's been very educational. Thank, thank you. you.